So we're very happy to have Sasha Shapiro, who will tell us about cluster realization of spherical Daha. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's a it's a, a pleasure to be at the seminar, and I haven't seen you all in ages, at least in person. Uh, so I'm, I am glad to be here. Uh, right, so I'd like to um, tell uh, about to speak about a joint work in progress with Philip De Francesco, Renat Kedem, and Gus Schrader, and indeed in concern uh, spherical double affine Heck algebra and some clusterization of it. So um, let me first try to explain the, the plan of the talk. So there's this spherical double affine Heck algebras in general um, associated to, to arbitrary simple simple Lie group, so I'll only talk about GLM case for now. I'll denote this double affine Heck algebra uh, by the symbol over here. Um, notably, this uh, this algebra it has an SL two Z action, which will be very important for us. Now, the theorem that I'd like to explain it's a well, it's a theorem in progress. So some parts of it are proven, some are not yet. I'll explain which uh, what what the status of it. Um, the theorem is as follows: so we can actually find a Quantum cluster variety. Again, I'll kind of give a definition by example of what this is. Um, in short, it's uh, some algebra uh, which you can define from the date of a quiver and this quiver, I'll denote this quiver Q over here. This will be the cluster quiver. And we can find an injective homomorphism from the spherical Dacha to this quantum cluster, cluster algebra. And we suspect this homomorphism to be an isomorphism, but this, this, is, uh, this is just a conjecture. There's, uh, no, really, uh, we don't know really good uh, any way to prove it yet. And moreover, um, we'll show that SL2Z acts on uh, spherical Dacha by cluster transformations. And then we'll discuss some uh, kind of some um, consequences of this story. All right. So um, uh, the idea of the proof is as follows: so the spherical Dacha actually has um, uh, a known, uh, okay, in a sense, a somewhat canonical um, uh, representation called polynomial representation. So it's some representation that was con constructed by Cherednik. It's a representation of this algebra uh, as Dacha uh, on a Hilbert space. This representation is on a Hilbert space. It's faithful and it is SL to Z equivariant. So if you wish, you can think of it as a, a representation of a semi-direct product of a group algebra of SL2Z and, and spherical Dach. Um, on the other hand, quantum every quantum cluster variety also have um, also has a canonical representation, the so-called positive representation, which also is faithful and equivalent with respect to the so-called mapping cluster groupoid, but um, in this case it will also be SL2Z equivalent. For, so this this extra extra discrete group will be SL2Z for cluster for cluster algebra as well, and the idea of the proof that one has an embedding of spherical Dacha into quantum cluster algebra will be as follows. So by making both algebras act in a faithful way in some on some Hilbert spaces, we embed them into kind of algebras well some 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 algebras of uh, operators on this Hilbert space. And in fact, both algebras will act by Q difference operators. And then we find a unitary equivalence between these two Hilbert spaces. Um, and then as soon as you find that, you can do the following thing. You can say, okay, fine. Let's take generators of the spherical Dacha. Look at their images inside, uh, well, endomorphisms of this, uh, of this uh, Hilbert space. Then see what happens to these generators when you um, uh, map it when when you push it through this uh, unitary equivalence and then just note that uh, image of generators of Asdaha inside endomorphisms of this Hilbert space lie inside the image of of uh, quantum cluster algebra again inside endomorphism of this Hilbert space right and this way you can construct an embedding right but I'll, I'll explain so that's the idea I'll explain um, the details uh, in like uh, well today and just one last thing about idea that I want to say that um, this uh, this unitary equivalence is actually given by the so-called spectral transform of the quantum total system. So quantum total system will appear at some point in this talk, and we'll discuss what its spectral transform is. All right. So that's the plan. 
Sasha, um, can, I, can I ask what kind of operators these actions are uh, represented by? What kind of operators on the Hilbert space? Right. If you just want, if you just honestly take the Hilbert space, then there will be some unbounded self-adjoint operators. Mm -hmm. But uh, then um, you can find a uh, short subspace in there on which they actually act by by bounded operators. So it's kind of maximal domain for those. And uh, when you uh, do cluster transformations, this subspace is preserved. Mm -hmm. And the SL2Z uh, action is by what kind of operators? Uh, so SL2Z action is given by cluster mutation. So each cluster mutation gives you um, an action. So it conjugates the cluster algebra by quantum dialogarithm. Yeah. And it acts on the Hilbert space by quantum dialogarithm. But if you kind of, if you want to just write it as Q gamma function as just series, then that will not do because uh, for the story you need q to be on the unit circle and then the series will diverge so you need to act really by the so-called non-compact quantum dialogarithm mm -hmm. right so that's that's the so to z also acts by unbounded operators on both actions on the hilbert spaces uh sl to z acts by um what the fuck? yes it does act by unbounded operators mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, but but again, there is a short, nice short subspace in which everything works fine. All right. All right. So let me now uh, kind of remind what what the DACA is. So at least the way I find it easiest to think about it is uh, you start with considering the so-called elliptic braid group, right? So you take a torus, uh, two-dimensional torus, and you take configuration space of n points on the torus. So I just draw on uh, this. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I draw on this. Uh, these points over here, and um, then you take the fundamental group of this configuration space, and you can see that the generators of the fundamental uh, fundamental group are um, it's the following triple. So you have generators, sorry, you have generators t1 up to t n minus one. You have generators x1, xn, and y1, yn, and the generators are realized. So t's just just uh, just um, rotate i and a plus ones point just. You can permute them in a clockwise direction, uh, counterclockwise direction. X takes i point and just uh, drags it in a horizontal uh, direction. The y takes y i takes i point and drag it in the vertical direction along the story. So these are the generators. You can write relations between them. Uh, I just skip that. We won't really use them um, explicitly. And then the DACA, the double of n Hecke algebra is the following. So you take the group algebra of this elliptic braid group, and you take this group algebra over the field of rational functions in two parameters, q and t. And then you mod it out by a quadratic relation, which is uh, just, uh, well, as, as written here, right? So uh, ti minus q inverse t times ti plus q t inverse is equal to zero. And you can see that in the case when q is equal to t, um, this just uh, turns uh, this part of our uh, DACA into um, into a wild group rather than rather than a braid group. Right? But in general, this uh, kind of this part is some deformation of the wild group. All right. <clears throat> now, what's the SL2Z action? Well, if from a torus, I clearly have an action of the mapping class group of the torus on this whole data, and um, uh, this mapping class group of the torus is generated by two elements, uh, the Dane twist along, uh, for example, those two cycles that I've drawn over here, right? So I took a, kind of, I took a basis in the in the um, uh, cohomology space of the torus, right? So I have this orange cycle and the green cycle, and uh, say a Dane twist along the orange cycle is the following. It's when I when I cut a torus along this orange cycle, rotate it 360 degrees and glue it back. So, for example, on this picture on the right, you see the result of applying the Dane twist uh, associated to the orange cycle to the green cycle, right? So, it kind of goes as it went, and then it rotates um, 360 degrees and then glues back. And then you can uh, you can write how these uh, two. So, right, the when I um, identify the mapping class group with SL2Z, the Dane twists become these two matrices. Clearly, they generate SL2Z. And you can write out explicitly what they do to generators. So to the first generators, they do uh, what, what you see over here, right? They preserve uh, T, T1, and then, well, some of them preserve X, some of them preserve Y. And to um, T1, 
ti or onto ith generated egg by slightly more complicated formulas that again I, i'll just uh, skip for now all right then inside the double and hack algebra you have um, a spherical subalgebra is the following thing so in fact inside daha you have an idempotent that some expression in terms of these generators uh this ti generators so it's an idempotent meaning that e square is equal to e but the side important is also preserved by the action of uh, the date twist, so by the action of the whole mapping class group. And therefore, you can form a subalgebra of the Daha, uh, which just um, looks like E times something the Daha times E again. Um, so clearly, if you compose two such things, you get again a thing of the sort. Um, so a unit inside there would be exactly our right important. And since um, both date twists preserve that important, then you still have a, a an action of SL two Z on this sub -algebra. so that will be our uh, our uh, our thing we would like to to work with. Now, what about the polynomial representation? So, um, in fact, we can actually give generators of um, just name generators of this algebra, and there is follows. So we had these generators uh, of the Daha X's and Y's, and uh, let us define uh, this generator P zero K which will be just the kth power sum of all generators wise and uh, well with two other points on, on the two on the two ends just an element over here and then you can start acting by elements of sl to z on this thing and um, we can define an element p a comma b uh, where a b are just two integers by the following rule so if g is an element of sl to z that sends vector 0k to vector a b then we just define element p a b as as element as this g from our sl to z applied to p zero k to the skate power sum and wise. Uh, well, of course we have to argue that this is well defined, but well yes it is. In particular, you can see that if you apply that e, by this definition that p k zero will be the kth power sum in axis. Right. Um, so. Instead of working with power sums, I'd prefer to work with elementary symmetric functions. So uh, I define these elements e k zero and e zero k, which are just uh, well again two wide importance on the sides. And in the middle, I have the elementary symmetric function of x's and y's. And uh, just a needless reminder that the elementary symmetric function uh, of uh, variables x one x n is uh, sum over all k. The elementary symmetric function is sum over all. Uh, <laughs> And products x i one x i k where i one is less than i two less than dot dot less than i k. Right? And there's a theorem by Shifton and Bassero that these p a b generate the spherical daha. Now, um, in fact, there is a stronger result that um, p one zero p zero one p minus one zero and p zero minus one generate the spherical daha. And therefore, if if those generate, then in particular, we know that e k naught e naught k e minus k naught and e naught minus k where k runs from one to n also generates spherical data so let's just remember that and we'll 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 use it as a remark at some point later so we have generators all right um and there is a polynomial representation of this spherical data constructed by chirednik uh it, actually sorry a representation of the whole data uh representation is as follows um rather than giving a definition i'll give some properties of it so it acts on Laurent polynomials in variables, uh, sorry, in variables um, x1 up to xn. Um, these are polynomials with coefficients in rational functions in our parameters q and t. But I just I don't just take Laurent polynomials; I take symmetric Laurent polynomials. So I, I take invariance with respect to the action of the of the symmetric group on n generators. Um, under this section, uh, the elementary symmetric function uh, ek naught just be, just goes to an elementary symmetric function of x's this is how it acts and the elementary symmetric function e not k becomes the following operator so let me then carefully go through it uh, we sum over all k element subset of um, uh, interest from one to n uh, so let's call a subset i and then we take a product overall over index i running in our subset and index j running everywhere but in our subset and then we have this, um, so we multiply uh, these fractions, Txi minus Xj over Xi minus Xj. And then we precompose it with just product of all the shift operators uh, from our um, from our 
subset, right? So I shift just uh, uh, sends a function of x to a function where well, we just shift xi by q multiplied by q, and uh, the operator xi just x by multiplication. So this is the polynomial representation, and of course you have similar polynomial representation when you act on functions of y rather than functions of x, and then the roles of vk0 and v0k swap, right? Now in this polynomial representation, it's it's usually it's so as you remember there are two day twists one preserves x's and another preserves y's and um, one of them is written very easily in in one polynomial representation uh, but horribly in another and vice versa so as soon as you write this polynomial representation you have explicit and a faithful representation of your data but the mapping class group is it's somewhat complicated to say what that is. i mean there are twist formulas but yeah they're not that easy all right so that's the story about data now, I promise that quantum Toda will appear. So let me uh, discuss the Toda system. Uh, again, I'll just restrict. Uh, so everything I'll say about Toda works for any type, but I'll just restrict myself to considering type A, GLN. <clears throat> so let G be the GLN. Um, the B plus and B minus will be two Borels, so upper and lower triangle matrices. H. Uh, H over here is a maximal torus, so just diagonal matrices in our case, intersection of B plus and B minus. Um, and then these guys here, these are the so-called double Brewer cells, um, where um, we take two elements of the wild group, U and V, we think of the wild group as a normalizer of a torus mod torus, and then we consider these subsets of G, um, which is B plus, U B plus, intersect B minus, V B minus, so that's a double Brewer cell. These things are uh, Poisson submanifolds, inside our uh, group G, if we put on our group G the standard Poisson structure, so the Poisson structure with respect to the standard uh, R matrix. All right, <clears throat> then um, the phase space of the classical Toda chain is the double Coxter Brewer cell modulo action of the torus by conjugation, right? So Coxter word in type A just means that uh, it's it's a product of uh, all elementary um, transpositions. You don't have to write them in order like I did. You can you can you can permute them, but just product just a product in which every elementary transposition appears exactly once. Um, so if you take the double Brewer cell, um, the dimension of it is three times rank. You multiply by the torus, you get two times rank. Okay, so you get a, a, a Poisson submanifold of dimension two times rank, actually symplectic submanifold. And um, uh, the Hamiltonians are uh, functions on the cell, right? That just evaluate the trace of an element in an, in the i-th fundamental representation, right? Or in the you know i-th wedge power of, of C to the n. All right, so we have exactly rank many of them. We get an integrable system. That's the classical Toda. Now this classical Toda have a cluster structure on it. So I would not like to give a, a definition of what cluster structure is, but I, I'll give some, oh, I'll say, so the properties of the structure that I'll, I'll use in this talk, right? Um, so it will be very combinatorial and uh, as kind of one combinatorial tool that I'll, I'll use uh, will be the so-called directed network, right? So directed network is just a planar bipartite graph Oh, sorry, well, okay, sorry, maybe I shouldn't say bipartite, I put planar bicolor graph, so I have vertices of two colors, uh, black and white, uh, so this is how I, I, I see black vertex and this is the white vertex, and um, arrows in this graph will be of two types, so, so sorry, ar arrows will satisfy the following, so a white vertex will have exactly one outgoing arrow, like, like written in here, and as many ingoing as we want, and black will be the opposite, it will have exactly one in incoming arrow and as many out outgoing errors as, um, yeah, as it wants. And then um, we can, um, to any, um, how to, say, to, to any, uh, the composition of uh, a Coxter word uh, into, into letters, into elementary uh, transpositions, we can associate uh, a directed network on a cylinder, right? So this here is a cylinder we identify these two sides uh, as i showed over here then this is an example for gl4 and that's why i have uh, these four lines exactly four of them right so i have li uh, these lines going left to right then um i have two wild words u and v 
they're both clocks towards. Let's say, for the sake of the argument, let's say they're S1, S2, S3, and another one is also S1, S2, S3. But because they're diff two different words, I want to somehow distinguish between them. So I'll just write one letter as just SI and another as SI bar, just to tell which alph alphabet they're from. And whenever I see a letter, um, say S2, uh, sorry. Whenever I see a letter, say S2, um, I'll draw a vertical arrow between the third, second and the third line. So I see a letter S3, I draw a vertical arrow between the third and the fourth line and so on, right? So whenever I draw an arrow, I put a black vertex at its source and the white vertex at, at its sink. And for S bar, I do exactly the same, but I now draw vertical arrows looking downward rather than, than upward. And then with this coloring and direction of the arrows, you can see that indeed this green, uh, green graph over here is a directed network. Now, uh, really the combinatorics of the cluster algebra will be uh, um, governed by the dual graph to this directed network. So um, for the dual graph, I need uh, to place uh, vertices at the faces of my network, right? So I, I um, over here I have vertex one. Uh, over here I have vertex two, but uh, remember it's on a cylinder, so this is really uh, the same the same face. So this is the same vertex. Uh, all right, and then. I draw an arrow between two faces, so between two vertices of the dual graph, uh, whenever uh, the corresponding faces share an edge with vertices of two different colors. So here I have ver black vertex and white vertex, and then I draw a blue arrow, arrow of the dual graph, and I direct it in such a way that white vertex stays on the right. So that's a convention, but that's I, I need to choose one. I always direct it so that white vertex stays on one side, say, in this case, on the right. Um, and whenever I see a um, uh, and and um, two faces that share an edge, but uh, the colors of birds on the sides of the edge are the same, then I just don't draw a blue arrow. Right? So in this way, I get a dual graph that's drawn over here, and this is the graph that um, tells the tells you the cluster structure on uh, on the face space of the uh, uh, Cox Rotoda system or on this GCC mod at H that reduced double draw cell. Now, what does it mean to have a cluster structure? Well, roughly the following. So um, it, it just means to have some nice coordinates, nice with respect to the post on structure. Um, so here's how we can think of them. Um, well, given this directed network, the, the one in green, I consider a matrix um, with entries mij, and the ijth entry of the matrix will be a sum of all paths from ith uh, vertex on the left to jth vertex on the right, um, and then a sum of all paths and take weight of a path. Where weight of a path is just product of weight of each face below the path. So for example, if I want to know the entry uh, M11, so let me maybe just write uh, yeah, here, I know M11 uh, will be, uh, well, I have, this path, right? Uh, so below, I don't have any faces, so I uh, I set weight to be one, and then I have another path, right? I have this path, and so I write one plus y one. So this is this is a matrix that I get, um, right? Maybe. Now you can see that this um, this matrix. Uh, so it doesn't have determinant one, and just to 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 account for it, I uh, so well. If I wanted to work with SLN rather than GLN, I'd I'd want to put determinant one, so I can just divide divide every entry by the uh, nth root of the determinant. So that's a useful thing to do. All right, and then I uh, parameterize every element from this reduced double coxer Brewer cell by the corresponding matrix. So what I claim is that. Uh, these matrices actually parameterize an open subset in this uh, phase space and variables y1, uh, sorry, y1, uh, y1 up to y2 and minus 2, so all these variables uh, over here, they uh, are uh, coordinates on an open cell uh, inside uh, the phase space and they're, they behave very nicely with respect to Poisson brackets, namely if I take a Poisson bracket between yj and yk, the result is just a constant, which is the number of arrows from j to k times uh, uh, yj times yk, right? So these coordinates are called log-canonical, 
because if you take logs, they become just constant. Uh, they, they, they have constant Poisson bracket. All right. Sorry, just a quick question. Does this setup make sense outside of the type A uh, case? Does it just make for more complicated combinatorics or is it? Is so it... outside of type A, the, the networks will become non-planner. So that's a problem. So, so networks um, are problematic but uh, yes, cl I'll say the, the, these dual graphs you work for any type, absolutely yes. So you should just define them in a different way than I did. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Sasha, I'm sorry. In your picture, what? I don't. Sorry, I don't see. Why do you have the blue arrows from Y six to Y four to Y two? Right, because um, oh, uh, from Y six to Y four to Y two. Indeed, why do I have them? Maybe I. Sh yeah, sorry, no, that's a mistake. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, that's a mistake. I yeah, all right, cool, thanks. Yeah, I don't have them exactly. Yeah, okay, good catch, thanks. <laughs> all right, all right, great. Um, so now, of course, we can choose. Um, so first of all, we've written this word, this this uh, double while word on the cylinder, so we can uh, we can a take letters and put and kind of rotate them and put them in the front of the word, take them from the back, put in front. We can permute letters and so on. So what happens when we permute letters? Well, for example, you can see that as you uh, say take a letter S1 bar and push it through S3 and then through S2 and do the same with S2 bar. So to get this word S1, S1 bar, S2, S2 bar, S3, S3 bar, nothing happens. So your your graph, your, your network changes a bit, but the measurement metric, the matrix M does not change at all, right? Uh, but if you do, uh, so some some um, operations on these words don't change the matrix, but some of them do a little. So for example, if you change S2 and S2 bar and just use a different word, uh, different double while word, then the matrix changes as uh, as drawn on this picture, right? So it's basically what happens to this, um, to this square uh, in the middle here, right? So this square has, so it, it we change the the black and the white vertices and 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 direction of arrows um and uh, therefore you can you can say okay well fine let's let's have primed coordinates so one y one y one prime up to y six prime and then i want to define these new prime coordinates from the condition that the two matrices have to coincide so i want these prime things to be still coordinates on the same space, but I just want them. I just want them to to give me a different chart on the same space, right? That's called cluster chart. And if you write this out, uh, what this means, this if you just write out what these formulas uh, give you, well, um, y one and y five are just the same as they were. Y three, the one that's set over here, um, will change to its inverse, and its neighbors will be either multiplied by one plus y three or divided by one plus y three to the power of number of arrows between the faces, right? So here we had one arrow, so we multiply by one plus by three to power one. Here we had two arrows, so we divided by one plus by three square. And sometimes you also have to do this monomial transformation multiplied by by three. Again, so this is, you can write it out explicitly. The, these formulas are not really important for the rest of the talk. This is just how it works. Now, um, in general, of course, uh, so going back to Peter's question, in general, you'd like to know what, um, what you do with the, on the level of dual graphs because dual graphs work for any type so really what you do is the following you, so what we did we altered the graph in the vicinity of the vertex number three uh, and uh, uh, this is how it works in general you so uh, let's look at this example if i want to mutate at vertex k uh, what i do i invert all the arrows adjacent to vertex k so you can see here that uh, directions are, are, are opposite then whenever I see an incoming edge and outgoing cage, I complete it to an oriented triangle. So that's how I get this new edge over here. And then um, on, on top, so I had a double arrow going this direction. So I still have kind of double arrow going this direction, right? But then I complete this, this thing to an oriented triangle and the two arrows going the opposite direction, they cancel out. So I just have this one arrow here. And the formulas, again, the formulas are similar to what we had before. So these formulas, how the new coordinates look like. Uh, so in this way, uh, the what you get, you on, at least on this Toda space, you get a uh, phase space or a Poisson manifold covered by a in general infinite collection of charts um, with uh, this gluing data, right? 
Now, uh, before on the previous slide, we just considered charts that uh, we can get one chart from another by doing something on the wild words. And the combinatorics of wild words is, of course, a finite combinatorics, right? But as we allow ourselves to mutate at any vertex of the of the graph, then we actually get infinitely many charts. And this is the kind of the setup for a cluster variety. Now, whenever I say cluster variety, I mean the following. So I mean, let's take the global algebra of functions. So take expression to pick a chart and take expressions in the coordinates of the chart in this y, y1 to yn that are Laurent polynomials in every single chart, right? So each chart is C star to what, the, the dimension. And I just ask uh, that uh, I have global functions. And then when I say cluster variety, at least today, I just mean that uh, I just take spectrum of this algebra. So it's an affine variety covered by infinite domain charts. All right. Um, now, uh, so we had phase space of the Toda. Now we can also express Toda Hamiltonians in this neat way in terms of these matrices. So Toda Hamiltonians will be, uh, well, by something like uh, this Gesell Vino type ar argument, I guess will be just some overall uh, k element subsets in one to the n of non of k tuples of non intersecting paths from subset i to to itself and then we just multiply the 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 weights of these paths together so if you write it out in particular you see that h1 is just trace of of the matrix m and well h h i will be the tra trace and the i fundamental representation a uh, Okay, not entirely obvious, but actually not not that hard of a result is that uh, these total Hamiltonians they're indeed um, global, global in the sense of the um, cluster variety, right? So they're uh, functions that are all run in every single chart, and of, of course, well, they're global functions on the on the phase space of the total system. Now, um, okay, so this is all classical story. Now I I need representation theory rather than Poisson geometry, so let's quantize it. Um, when I when we say quantize, we mean that we just replace our cluster coordinates by some operators. Uh, I'll just uh, denote them uh, capitalized Y um, and Poisson brackets. So before I had this Poisson bracket, which was log canonical, and the coefficient just depended on the number of arrows between the two nodes. I have the same here. So the Poisson bracket between y, uh, the commutation relations between Y J and Y K, they just Q commute. And the power of Q is the number of errors from K to G. So if you take a quasi-classical limit, you'll exactly recover the, the Poisson brackets that we started from. Um, well, maybe maybe to recover it on the nose, you, you need a coefficient two here, but again, let's disregard it. Um, right. So, uh, all right. So this is, uh, once again, this is our quiver. Uh, these are the quantum cluster coordinates. Now, these quantum cluster coordinates, um, uh they so so if we look at this one quantum cluster chart that acts on a representation so how do we define this representation one way to do that is as follows let's just take um functions um polyno Laurent polynomials in variables lambda one up to lambda n uh, with coefficients rational functions in q and then i ask all the even nodes to act by ti i plus one over ti and all the odd nodes to act by lambda plus one over lambda i, where lambda just acts by multiplication and t acts by shift, right? So in other words, really what I've done is the following. I said, okay, let's take root system of type a n and kind of place uh, roots written in terms of multiplication operators uh, on uh, on here and place roots written in terms of shift operators in here, right? That's why I write t alpha i, because alpha is what epsilon i plus one minus epsilon i, right? And then just connect them by the arrows so that the commutation relations are 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 like over here right so so the data of this quiver is really just the same as the data of um well the data of the quiver can be can be recovered from the data of um of how these things act oops sorry again how these things act on a representation now um so what did i just say I say that is if you have a quantum cluster chart then you get a representation right but of course, you should ask, okay, fine, but what if we chose a different uh, polarization of the same variable? So what if I uh, do some linear change of coordinates and uh, say send, or uh, monomial change of coordinates and send lambda i to lambda i times ti, right? Clearly, I'll get different formulas, so I'll get different representation. Well, if I do that, then Stone von Neumann theorem tell, tells me that 
I'll get a unit equivalent representation. So indeed, if I have a quantum cluster chart up to unit equivalence, I get a unique representation. Um, well, uh, maybe, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, maybe I should be a little careful about the word unique, but okay, I, I get a canonical representation this way. And if I go to a different cluster chart, well, um, then technically speaking, I have, I have an algebra, I have two charts, so two localizations of the same algebra, and I can pull back representations from these charts to the algebra. And then these representations do not have to coincide and in general, they don't, but again, by a result of Fokin Gonchro, these two representations are unit equivalent. So at the end of the day, to write a representation explicitly, I just pick a chart, pick a polarization, write a representation. And this way I get up to unit equivalence, I get a uniquely defined representation. All right, so this is the positive representation of a quantum cluster algebra. In this case, we've just discussed how, uh, how it looks explicitly for a quantum total system. All right. Sasha, I just didn't understand uh, when you define the representation of Laurent polynomial ring, you mm -hmm. think of it as you think of some sort of Hubert space completion of that Laurent polynomial ring. What? what? Exactly. I'll, I'll discuss that in a second. Uh, I'll, but but if you so when I discuss the po the pos the polynomial representation, I also act on act on polynomials. We'll we'll uh, pass to completion in a second. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Good. Uh, yeah. Right, now, one other ingredient that will be really helpful is the so-called day twist. And here's what it is, right? So you can think, so let's think of the following space. Let's think of moduli space of G local systems on a cylinder with an extra date of a pair of flags, right? So if we, have an, we have a cylinder. Uh, again, I just identified these two sides. And I have a marked point on each side of the cylinder. So I have a marked point on this bound, on the top boundary, so this is the same marked point, and marked point on the bottom. Now I choose a flag uh, at each mark point, so at f1 and f2, and then uh, as I uh, as I have a G local system, so I can apply monodromy to this data, and at these two points I'll get uh, two new flags, uh, the monodromy applied to these two flags. But then I can also I can factor my monodromy into so if the flags were in generic position, then I can first take a part of the monodromy that preserves. Uh, flag f2 so if you wish it you can think of it as an upper triangular matrix uh, and then uh, when I apply it to f1 I, let's call it this part of the monodromy g plus so I apply it to f1 I get g plus f1 and then the rest of the monodromy will be preserving g plus f1 so if you wish it would be lower triangular matrix um, and it will send f2 to g minus f2 right so uh, and the full monodromy will be just product of g doing that sorry about that g plus and g minus right so you can see indeed that uh, if i take the monodromy i uh, well and i apply this g minus g plus to f1 i get g plus f1 and i apply it to f2 i get g minus f2 in other words i just take monodromy and i just decompose it into an upper and lower triangular matrices right now um if the if i choose this data of a pair of generic flags and the monodromy that's again just a generic matrix then um, i'll find myself in the big brewer cell so brewer cell b plus w not b plus intersect b minus w not b minus but if i want uh, the monodromy matrix to lie in a double coxer cell then uh, really this is the condition that g plus part lies in the cell g uh, one comma c so the first word is trivial the second word is is coxer and g minus lies in the in the other so g uh, c comma one right so that's how that's just a different way to think about the phase space of the total system just consider these type monodromies and a day twist is an operation on our phase space it's not a morphism of our phase space which has several equivalent descriptions and pick the one you like so it's either in cluster terms, you can think of flipping this diagonal. Equivalently, you can think of just refactor. So before we factorized our matrix as, pos as upper borel, lower borel. Now we're just refactorizing as lower times upper, right? Um, equivalently, you can think of it as cluster mutations at uh, all the odd nodes. So in other words, at all the uh, sources of the double arrows in this quiver. Or equivalently, if you like discrete integrable system, you can think of one step evolution of, a, of the so-called Q system, right? So these are all the same things. And we'll call this the twist uppercase D. 
And uh, it's a really easy and nice uh, calculation that uh, this date with commutes with total Hamiltonians, right? So, um, uh, right, so you can, or I should rather say, maybe I should I quantum total Hamiltonians, I can also quantize the date twist and I and these operators will commute. All right, okay. Now, um, so we discussed Toda systems now, I promise that indeed Hilbert spaces will appear. And I promise that some Whitaker, that the, the um, spectral transform of the Toda system will appear. So here we go. So first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to indeed introduce Hilbert spaces. Here's how we do it. Um, so first of all, I ask you to be on the union circle. I don't ask it to be a root of unity. In fact, it's actually simpler when it's not, but but if, if it is, it's fine. Um, so Q is a root of Q is on the unit circle. I parameter it as P I B square, where B is a real number. I is obviously the imaginary unit. Then I had these um, ver uh, well variables on on polynomials of which I acted right lambdas and x's. So both of them. So I would like to think of lambda as e to well this constant two pi b times lowercase lambda j, right? And then the shift operator I can write as say e to the minus i b d over d lambda j. It takes exactly shifting by q the 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 uppercase lambda j, right? The same for x's and gammas, right? So x is e to the two pi b x j, uh, and gamma is the shift. Gamma is the shift operator uh, written like that. Then the quantum toda acts on alto functions of uh, variable lambda, lowercase lambda, with just the usual Lebesgue measure, and again, for the lack of a better uh, better name for it, I just call this this H two, so the second Hilbert space, the Hilbert space of the positive representation. Right? Again, it, as as Milan as Milan said, it's it's just a it just a Hilbert space completion of the action I had before. And similarly, I can ask uh, as Daha to also act on some Hilbert space. This is L two of x variables. Um, I wish to choose a slightly different measure, uh, so I, it's up to me really which measure to choose, but uh, it's useful, and people, what people usually do, they choose the so-called Sklyanian measure. Again, the precise formula doesn't matter all that much, but it's written explicitly in terms of some, some hyperbolic signs. But then remember, I was acting on symmetric polynomials, so here I also want to act on symmetric L2 functions. Okay, both actions are in, are in terms of Q difference operators, both actions uh, act by kind of self-adjoint and, and both things act by self-adjoint and, um, sorry, the, the chain operators uh, act by self-adjoint and uh, uh, unbounded operators, but yeah, that's our representation. Now, for q Toda inside that that uh, quantum cluster algebra, right, we had the uh, Toda Hamiltonians and we had a day twist and they all commuted. So it's natural to ask for their joint eigenfunctions and the Whitaker function, that again can be written explicitly, and I omit that, uh, is this joint eigenfunction for uh, for Toda Hamiltonians and the date twist, right? So, so what is this thing? So, this is an element inside this uh, Hilbert space. Uh, so it clearly depends on lambda, right? It's a function inside here. Uh, the subscript x just means the eigenvalues. Uh, it just encodes the eigenvalues with which Toda Hamiltonians and the Dane twist act on these functions. So, say, uh, k Toda Hamiltonian act uh, on this function with an eigenvalue elementary symmetric function in x. We'll see that in, on the next slide. Now, um, to be completely precise, well, we're doing some Hilbert spaces, functional analysis. So really, this thing is not an element of the L2. It's rather what what's called a tempered distribution. So it's kind of as close to to being uh, to being an element of this space, but not 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 really. And then the only thing, the, the next thing I want to do, I want to just pass to an eigenbasis of of this uh, H K and D. So I want to do some analog of a Fourier transform that we call Whitaker transform. So it happens to it, it's it's a map as I've written from uh, uh, this Hilbert space H, from the Hilbert space H two to the Hilbert space H one right where a function f of lambda 
is sent to some function that let's call it f hat of x to make it look similar to Fourier transform, which is just an integral of f of lambda against the, the Whitaker function. So this, this is indeed an operation that will diagonalize um, those operators for which, uh, for which uh, Whitaker functions are, uh, are eigenfunctions, right? Um, now, well, again, I, maybe I should have put the, the complex conjugation here. It depends on your definition of a Whitaker function. Uh, right, so to look at more like a Fourier transform. All right, so this is a Whitaker transform. And something that uh, Gus and I managed, uh, Gus Schrader and I managed to prove is that this Whitaker transform is a unitary equivalence, right? And really, this is just um, uh, uh, this is kind of formal way to say that Whitaker functions are orthogonal and complete, in the right sense of these words, uh, in that Hilbert space, right? Uh, really, they kind of they are kind of delta orthogonal and delta complete, so they they just delta functions, really. but right. So so in other words. Uh, this Whitaker transform is a unitary equivalent. And then we can ask, okay, fine, we've got the unitary equivalent. What happens to operators we're interested in when we push them through this Whitaker transform? So as I said before, the Toda Hamiltonians, when you act on this uh, Whitaker, uh, Whitaker function, the output, the, the, it's the same as just multiplying this Whitaker function by an elementary symmetric function on axis. Right of of axis, sorry. And when you act by a Dane twist on this function, uh, you get uh, this uh, this Dane twist from from before, from the beginning of this talk, the talk. One of those tau one. So the one that um, commuted with axis, right? So uh, again, this is just um, a multiplication of this function by some well by some some some. Some explicit function in terms of uh, logs of these variables. So this way, at this point, we really get one half of the daha, right? Because we get kind of well, if you wish, half of generators and one of the day interest. But now we would like to have the second one, and to do that, we would like to kind of again get intuition from um, from these um, modal spaces of flat con uh, modal spaces of G-local systems. So before we considered the smaller space of gel and local systems on a, a cylinder, right? Um, and we considered this monodromy kind of around this cylinder, right? So we had this mod like space. We had some conditions on, on monodromy. It wasn't generic, uh, right? And then we, we considered this monodromy matrix. Uh, but now I'd like to do the opposite. I, not the opposite, but now I'd like to kind of consider the vertical monodromy, right? Um, so. Uh, I'll, right. In order to do that, uh, I, I'll need once again it's a couple of combinatorial uh, things. So um, I had so this is the old quiver I had, and now I augment my quiver with two more vertices. So I put one vertex on the top, uh, one vertex on the bottom. I want kind of these triangles to be oriented, so um, uh, you can figure out what the labels of these vertices are, right? So in the representation, this one has to act by lambda 1, t1. This one has to act by lambda n, t, and inverse. And technically speaking, when I add these two vertices, the adjacency matrix of the quiver, it stops being non-degenerate, right? So it has core rank 2. And in fact, I could have written, you know, times, um, say, alpha over here and times beta over here, and let alpha and beta be just uh, to... Uh, constants that or two elements that commute with everything else with all t's and lambdas and that would still be i would still have the same uh, the same um the same cover right the same uh, commutation relations uh right but let's let me put let me say that both alpha and beta are one for now now how do i define this vertical monodromy um well combinatorially or actually yeah, before i do combinatorial let me maybe just just draw it um so Oh, sorry. So, um, so when I was talking about green monodromy, right, we had this cylinder and we had these flags F1 and F2, they were in generic position. Then I had the green monodromy G, uh, let's call this G. And so I had these flags GF1 and GF2. These two flags were also in generic position and uh, kind of naively, well, what I'm going to say, it's a lie, but not too much of a lie. The two flags in generic position in CN define your basis. Well, 
Rather, of course, they define you as just a collection of lines, but, well, there is a way to make them into bases. Um, and these two also define your basis in CN. And then you could just consider your monodromy matrix is just a matrix that takes one basis to another. But if I want to consider vertical monodromy matrix, that's that's not going to work because these two flags are not in generic position. The condition that we live in this Coxter Bruja cell tells us that they're exactly not in generic position. So we need to fix that, and what we do is just uh, uh, kind of think that we live on a universal cover and add as many cylinders as we need. Well, let's see, kind of infinitely many, right? So here we have g square of one, and here we have g square. Sorry. Uh, so this is g f2 and this is g square f2 and the end i'll have somewhere g n minus 1 f1 g to the n minus 1 f2 and now indeed uh, these two flags will now be in generic position these two flags will be in generic position and they can take a take a define a basis from these two flags and the basis from these two flags and take a matrix that takes from takes me from one basis to another right now how does it look um in combinatorially well, I've just ta uh, taken my, my green network and kind of unrolled it onto universal cover, right? So this is, uh, the, well, this network is infinite. It's how it looks on the universal cover. If you're looking for a fundamental domain, well, for example, uh, say, I don't know, uh, this one would be, right, uh, a fundamental domain. Uh, right then uh, in order to define an again an n by n matrix i take well in this case it's four by four i take um uh, four um four um arrows on the top right but okay so so um, i take four arrows on the top and i specialize four consecutive arrows to look upward right i i want a monodromy going in this direction so what i do i take Again, some kind of recipe, how to write this monodromy matrix. Take four consecutive arrows and orient them upward. And as you do that, uh, you can actually see that uh, the rest of the network is uniquely defined by the rules that we um, assigned to black and white vertices. So as soon as we ask that this arrow is oriented upward, then the rest have to be oriented uh, towards our white vertex, right? And here, again, we have the same story. Then it forces, so now this is a black vertex that has two outgoing arrows. So the last one has to be incoming. And uh, kind of this this pattern uh, uh, forces the orientation of the network. All right, so uh, then I take uh, four outgoing arrows on the top. All other vertical arrows on the top and the bottom will have to be uh, will have to be oriented inward inside the, our network. And I take four consecutive on the bottom and consider a, a measurement matrix um, from well from um, from these four to these four uh, from these four entries to these four exits on the top and now uh, again as i um, can what's a path of a what's a path of um, what's a weight of a path well say weight of this path right it's uh, it's uh, uh, just product of all these faces that live between that one and say the one on the right the right one. and then we again divide by that and root of the determinant all right so this is the uh, this is our mo vertical monodromy matrix um and here's a nice thing so you can actually calculate what happens to its entries and even minors under the whitker transform so if you choose so this is an n by n matrix and if you choose two partitions of length k um so that k is at most um at most uh, uh so that lambda k is at most uh, n minus k um so choose two partitions and then you you look at the sub matrix of our measurement vertical monodromy matrix right that sits in the intersections of rows lambda one plus lambda plus one up to lambda k plus k and columns mu one plus one up to mu k plus k right well these entries of partition of course do not have to be distinct i, I just spread them out by, by adding this kind of standard row thing right uh and then on the Whittaker transform what happens to the determinant of, of to this minor to determinant of m lambda mu is the following. So it becomes it has our it has the familiar form. So it's sum over all k element subsets of uh, one up to n of the following. So um, on the right you have still the product of shift operators within our subset. Uh, 
pre-multiplied by a product of these denominators, xi minus xj, i lives in the subset j does not. And then uh, we have two, two uh, sure functions. So mu over here is our partition mu, and this is a sure function on the variables from our subset. And then lambda prime is the conjugate partition to lambda, and um, uh, it's a sure function here depending on all variables but those in our subset, right? So all other variables. Uh, and that, in fact, allows us to calculate the what uh, what happens to all of these elements P, A, B under inverse Whitaker transform as we wanted in the beginning, right? But the trouble here is the following. So I take this P, A, B, and I can write it. So each of those things in its polynomial representation, it depends polynomially on variable T, right? So I can write it as a polynomial in T, and then each coefficient push through this Whittaker transform. So I'll get something um, inside this quantum, sorry, inside this quantum cluster algebra, tans well, I, I'll get a polynomial in T with coefficients inside this quantum cluster algebra, right? So, so inside that algebra given by the disk over here. And that's not really satisfactory because obviously uh, I won't get, uh, this way I won't get, um, the, the, this is, will obviously be an injective homomorphism, but it doesn't have a chance to be uh, an, an, a bijection, right? So I need a, a slightly, the, this, this algebra is too big, and the image will be small inside there. So I need a better idea. Better idea is as follows. You take the quiver we've seen on the previous slide, on the one, the one before, and these two hanging um, uh, vertices, we glue them together. As you glue the vertices together, if you want to preserve the commutation relations, you just uh, multiply the, the labels that they had. So it's now lambda 1t1 over lambda ntn. Now, I mentioned that there are two, there, there is a freedom for a Casimir. So there is a freedom for a parameter that commutes with everything, right? Because this, uh, the adjacency matrix of this quiver has core rank one. Let's call this parameter t, right? So this node y naught will be really lambda 1t1 over lambda ntn times t. And now we, this, this is now a quiver that we can draw on so this is quiver drawn on a torus, right? And now we can unroll it in both directions. We unroll it on the universal cover in the in kind of this horizontal direction and to in the, to universal cover in the vertical direction. And this is just a kind of finite part of the network uh, of the direct network that we see, right? Now, if we want to, well, I should be a little careful about when I say directed network because here we cannot really put a network structure on it, right? Uh, the arrows won't, we, we can never put arrows in a consistent way, but um, uh, we can, if we want to know what total Hamiltonians are, we'll just take a fundamental domain here, orient them as before, and here are your total Hamiltonians. If you want uh, uh, the kind of this, this, uh, this operate, this Q difference operator that we've seen on the previous slide, take a vertical fundamental domain, calculate that. Right, so then um, what are total Hamiltonians, right? They're, they are sum of all non-intersecting paths p1 up to pk weights of these paths L kind of in along this uh, submatrix, and we have different operators delta k, which are sum over non-intersecting paths p1 pk again with their weights along this submatrix, right? So this delta k are um, uh, some are the principal minors of this matrix M lambda mu. And uh, uh, again, just by this calculation that I showed before, you know that HK, when it acts on a Whitaker function, it's, it just acts as EK naught, and delta K acts as E naught K. At this point, really, we already have an embedding of, um, of uh, spherical DACA into this quantum cluster algebra defined by this, by this, uh, this picture here, defined by this quiver here, just because we can also do the same for E minus K naught and E naught minus K, and that's it. But really, we'd still like to know what's the SL2 Z action. And this is the part that is, uh, that is still in progress. Uh, so I guess I, I should stop by now, right? Can I have another two minutes, maybe? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry about that. All right. Cool. So yeah. So if you want SL2 Z action, right? We, we know, we've already seen what the day twist, uh, what one of the day twist is, right? It's just mutation at all the sources of double arrows, right? That we've seen. Now, what's the second day twist? Well, it's kind of complicated to write, and this is a work in progress. So instead of really writing tau two, we'd like to rather write this 
per S matrix, which is this uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, uh, S, S and tau 1 will still give us the whole SL2Z. And, um, um, right, so examples of this. So in SL, in SL2, uh, this is just a permutation of variables, in S and monomial transformation. In SL3, this is actually a mutation at, at this vertex. So you can see if you mutated this vertex, what happens with the quiver uh, so this is honestly what happens with the quiver and you can see that this is just up to permutation of variables this is the quiver we had from before right so uh in sl4 or gl4 sorry you have to mutate at here 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 and here you get a quiver like that sorry, i keep doing that all right yeah you have a quiver like that it's still isomorphic to the query we had before, but just with permitted variables. So the, the most embarrassing part of this whole story is that we know, uh, or at least a candidate for us, for up to GL, I guess, eight, <laughs> and we still don't see the general pattern, which is extremely embarrassing and stupid. But uh, yeah, that's that's the kind of complicated combinatorics. Uh, but that's right. Um, and just to summarize what's going on is the following, right? So really the the, Geometrically, what we're talking about is uh, the the modelized space of geolocal systems on a punctured torus, where we ask that both monodromies, this and this one, they uh, live in the in the uh, in, in the double coxer cell, right? So they're degenerate in a specific way. Then, as we uh, take the corresponding quantum cluster algebra, and we uh, calculate these positive representations. <laughs> Well, if we so so, um, so uh, depending on in which chart we write them. So if we write them in chart that's that's useful, that's easier for the orange cycle. So a chart like that, we'd see that uh, well, uh, toward the Hamiltonians along this kind of along this direction will just become uh, this uh, ek naught on weaker transform. And and these uh, delta k they will they will be kind of, they will be similarly calculated uh, paths in a in a network but just longer paths right more complicated paths. If we go to a different cluster, so the cl cluster which is uh, more friendly with respect to the green cycle, the the delta k's will just become paths like like we had for the Hamiltonians in the beginning, but the h's will become more complicated paths. Uh, uh, like in this in this vertical direction. Now, as we do Whitaker transform over here, we do a Whitaker transform with respect to these two other Hamiltonians. So, HK, so HK start to act as elementary symmetric function in axis, and delta K start to act as McDonald operator in axis. Now, over here, as we do Whitaker transform, uh, or maybe I should say rather inverse Whitaker transform, um, uh, with respect to these guys now, the the delta Ks, right? Because they're shorter, they're simpler. Uh, these things start to act as McDonald operators and Ys, but these guys start to act as as elementary symmetric function and Ys, right? And then uh, from the spherical Dacha, so so to go from spherical Dacha to here and to here, you just use two different polynomial representation: polynomial representation in axis or polynomial representation in Y. And just as one last uh, thing to say, kind of as a corol nice corollary, uh, so it means in particular that if you take McDonald polynomial in here, so you write it in, so you, you take you take elementary symmetric function in, in y variables, you write it as McDonald operator in x variables, then you push it through with the grid transform, which is a unitary transformation, and then you do some cluster mutations, which is again a unitary transformation. You see that McDonald operators become Toda Hamiltonians. So in particular, as a nice kind of addition to the story, is that really the story about McDonald operators and therefore their eigenfunctions can be it's unitary equivalent to a story about total Hamiltonians and 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 their eigenfunctions. Uh, that might be actually useful. Um, well, and the rest I hope as well. Okay, that's it. And thank you very much for listening. Sorry for overtime.